Hey guys, what's up? It's Kenya and welcome back to my channel. So today is going to be my second true crime video and today we are discussing the Gainesville serial killer that was active from 1989 to 1990. The reason I decided to cover this case is because I actually go to the University of Florida which is in Gainesville, Florida, which is kind of terrifying. The victims of this killer were UF students, which is just very terrifying and frightening. I just wanted to say, when I lived in my apartment last year in Gainesville, which is very close to where some of these murders happened, and I always remember being absolutely terrified in my apartment when my roommates were not home. I just remember having severe insomnia, anxiety, sleep paralysis, just being terrified to go to sleep at night alone in that apartment. It was just one of my worst fears ever when my roommates were not home and I was home alone and it was just very terrifying. Now granted I do get scared like anytime I'm alone but I just really got scared in that apartment in Gainesville and it was really close to where these murders happened. Let's just jump right into this case. It is definitely a disturbing one so if your discretion is advised um, I will be talking about some pretty disturbing things in this video. So the Gainesville serial killer actually inspired the filmmaker of Scream, the Ghostface Killer. Um, that was this killer was that inspiration for that character. I've never seen Scream, and I definitely won't be checking it out anytime soon, considering all the circumstances that I live so close to where this happened, and also that I'm a pussy. So I will not be. I will not be watching. In August of 1990, students were moving into their dorms and apartments in the Gainesville area. University of Florida is a huge school with about 30,000 students enrolled, so August move-in week is super hectic there. I can speak from experience. Um, it's just very hectic. There's a lot of students moving into dorms and apartments and a lot of just family members there dropping off their kids and there's a lot of things going on. A lot of family members there, a lot of people moving into their apartment. On August 23rd of 1990, two roommates by the name of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson were freshmen at UF and they were moving into their apartment at Williamsburg Village, which I believe is still there I think I pass it like pretty much every time I go to Walmart I pass this apartment complex so they were actually on the night of August 23rd they went to Walmart to get some supplies for their apartment some decorations and just some general housing supplies that you need for your apartment or dorm so then the two girls went home that night to their apartment and were never seen or heard from again Christina Powell's parents decided to visit her on August 27th of 1990. So they called her, couldn't get a hold of her, you know, she wasn't answering her phone. They thought that was really strange of her, definitely out of character. So they showed up to her their apartment complex at the Williamburg apartment and they knocked on the door and they didn't get an answer. So they looked around and they kind of saw that the lights were turned off and it didn't really look like anybody was home, but they found it strange because Christina Powell's car was still in the parking lot which is weird because where this apartment complex is um, is really not close to anywhere you can walk you kind of have to drive or take the bus everywhere because it's not really close to anything it's on a it's on like a long road that goes right into the main town center of Gainesville so you can't really walk anywhere unless you're like walking a dog or something you can't really walk anywhere so they found it strange that Christina's car was still in the parking lot and she wasn't answering. The police officers arrived at their apartment, busted open the door, and uncovered a truly horrifying scene. Inside the apartment, they discovered the dead bodies of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson. They found Sonia Larson's body upstairs in her bedroom. She had 22 stab wounds on her body and had scratches and cuts all over her arms indicating that she fought with her killer, she fought for her life. The killer then dragged her body and posed it in a sexually suggestive position after she had passed. The killer then went downstairs where he discovered Christina Powell sleeping. She had tape on her wrists and over her mouth and she had been stabbed five times to death. She had been sexually assaulted and the killer had cut her nipples off and the nipples were not found in the crime scene indicating that the killer had taken her nipples with him 
and sometimes this is something that psycho crazy people do killers they kind of take something from the crime scene as a trophy kind of you know how dexter took the person's blood or just kept something of them um as kind of a trophy police noticed that christina's body had seemed to be washed and they found a wash cloth and washing substance around her around the crime scene so her body had been washed to kind of get rid of any possible signs of forensic evidence also it was weird um and this will come back into play but the killer had cut uh christina's because they were discovered naked and uh the killer had cut christina's clothes off of her he didn't like rip them off or just take them off normally he cut them with like a scissor when you walk into a scene like this it's crazy out of a movie so at first police maybe thought that it was maybe a robbery gone wrong but nothing appeared to be missing from the apartment and also i don't know about you but i don't think robbers usually like kill their victims in this way i mean if you're gonna rob if you're gonna rob somebody and kill somebody you're probably just gonna shoot them you know if you're gonna rob them so they ruled out uh, burglary almost immediately so then they tried to look into christina and sonia's life to see if they had any like ex-boyfriends or any crazy people enemies in their life that might want to harm them but after talking to christina and sonia's family they couldn't really think of anyone that would hurt them in this way they were both two they were loved girls and sweet girls and no one would be this evil to hurt them they had no enemies police were actually fearing the worst so this was a random attack by somebody that just genuinely liked to kill people and found pleasure in sexually assaulting women and killing them so they knew that they had a serious case on their hand and that this person may strike again around this time police had gathered information that there was another missing teenager with a similar description as christina and sonia a young brunette female who lived in gainesville so the name of this girl was 18 year old Krista Hoyt and she was actually a student at Santa Fe College which is a little bit away from UF but kind of still in the same vicinity of where the first murders happened. So Krista did not show up to work on Monday. Krista worked for the Alachua County Sheriff's Department as a, a desk clerk I believe and she didn't show up for work and she also didn't call to say that she wouldn't be there for work which was pretty out of character for Krista. She would never really you know not show up to work and like not call in the fact that this was very out of character for krista coupled with the fact that two girls had just been discovered murdered dead in their apartment that matched the description of krista a young brunette white girl uh people were kind of freaked out so her co-workers went ahead and they went to her apartment and um knocked on her door see if they could try to get a hold of krista see if they get into her apartment, see if she was there, see if she was safe. So they showed up to Krista's apartment complex and they noticed some weird things. So the crime scene photo shows that there was a chain link fence that had been kind of a bent and um, unstable that were was, was on the side of the apartment. And also the lock on the sliding door of Krista's apartment had been tampered with. It was unstable and hanging loosely from the sliding door. They called in police and uh there was blinds covering the sliding door but part of the blind didn't go all the way to the floor so a police officer went ahead and looked underneath the blind and saw krista's deceased body posed on the bed Krista's body was found on her bed in a sitting position she was slumped over in a sitting position and she was also found decapitated and her cause of death was actually only one stab wound to the back like i said the killer decapitated her and her head was found on a bookshelf her head was found parallel to her body on a bookshelf decapitated head was facing her body krista's nipples were also cut off and placed right next to her on the bed there were so many similarities with how krista's body was discovered she had also been sexually assaulted her body was also posed. She was taped up, her hands were bound, and her clothing had been cut off of her body. Police theorize that her body was found about two days after the 
murder was committed and that the killer actually stayed in her apartment for a while because did some science with how the blood flow was and when she was decapitated uh, that had been hours after she already died because the blood flow had stopped so she was decapitated a couple hours after she was killed. So the police thought that maybe this is time to report that there is a serious threat, serial killer danger on the loose. So they reported to Gainesville, made everybody aware that there is a madman on the loose. Some guy is killing women and he's batshit crazy and keep uh, alert up for him. So as you can tell, you know, students are just moving in. I can imagine that people were extremely terrified. So not too long after this announcement, two more bodies were found. The next day, right after police had made this announcement, people had noticed that two more students had been missing. And these students were, were Tracy Powell's and Manny Taboda. Tracy and Manny were friends from high school that happened to get into UF together and decided to room together at the Gatorwood Apartments, which is now called the Bertram in case you go to UF and you know, big apartment complex on Archer. So Manny's friends arrived at his apartment after not hearing from him for a few days and um, they knocked on his apartment door and no one answered. And so they went down, Manny's friends went down to the leasing office and um, asked if the leasing manager would go ahead and check on their friend, do like a wellness check. And so when the leasing manager got there, he actually had the key. He opened up the door and didn't even want to open it up anymore. He saw enough. He saw blood and a black bag. So he immediately called the police. So when the police showed up, when they opened the door, there was blood, but there was no black bag. The black bag had been moved, indicating that when the leasing manager first went up there, when Manny's friends um, went up with him to do a wellness check the killer was likely still in the apartment when they checked which is just very terrifying the police officers entered the apartment Tracy had been killed in her bedroom and then her body had been dragged to the hallway of the apartment and she had been posed in a sexually suggestive position Tracy's body was found mangled tied up and had three stab wounds she had also been sexually assaulted and her nipples were not cut off. Then Manny was found in his bedroom and he had cuts and stuff all over his body, stab wounds all over him. Um, you can really tell that Manny did pit, put up a fight. He was a pretty um, big, like shapely dude. So he did put up a fight against the killer, but ultimately his efforts didn't work. And, it, the, and police speculate that the killer actually killed Manny first and then killed Tracy, obviously, because um, if it had been the other way around, then why he was killing Tracy, Manny could have killed him and vice versa. Police also speculate that maybe the killer didn't know that Manny was going to be there because Manny doesn't really fit the description of Tracy, Krista, Christina, and Sonia. So um, the killer was likely targeting, you know, young brunette girls and he might have not known that Manny was in the apartment with um, Tracy that night. So after this now third killing, people were, parents were withdrawing their students from classes, people were getting guns, pepper spray, tasers. After the murders of Tracy and Manny, the murders had seemed to stop, so that kind of gave police some time to sit down and kind of figure out who did this, because likely it was the same person, everyone was killed in kind of the same manner, and a lot of similarities. So they suspected that it was the same person and they just needed to find out who this person was. So what the police did was they made a suspect profile. So according to how the crimes were committed, police will create a suspect profile of who they likely think committed these murders, kind of finding similarities between them and distances. And with all that calculations, they came up with a suspect profile. So they believe that the killer is a single white man in his mid 20s to early 30s he is likely a loner kind of strange maybe has a history of assault and 
just a criminal background likely it wasn't his first time committing murders like this or assaults like this on women so they had expected that he has a lengthy criminal history but police also were able to collect a semen sample from one of the crime scenes and from the semen sample along with the suspect description police were able to gather a list of about 600 men in the Gainesville area that could possibly be the killer so with this information police started interviewing these men collecting DNA samples police zeroed in on an 18 year old named Edward Humphrey Edward Humphrey was someone that was kind of on a lot of people's radar because he used to live in the same apartment complex as Tracy and Manny Edward had actually been kicked out or evicted from the apartment because he had kind of been acting erratic towards some of the tenants and people kind of didn't really like him living in the apartment he was acting erratic making threats to other tenants and so he was kicked out of the apartment complex people also say that edward had a little bit of a crush on tracy which may be a motive um maybe he was rejected or something so people thought maybe this was his motive in august of 1990 around the same time these murders were being committed edward was actually arrested for assaulting his grandmother when police got him into custody, they discovered that he had a lot of mental illness, mental problems. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which is a disorder characterized by states of extreme depression and manic stages. So these manic stages is maybe when he lashed out and killed uh, Christina, Sonia. And then he also had some depression stages. That's kind of how bipolar works. You go on and off with the stages lasting from weeks to months. So police had thought that they caught the killer. He kind of matched the profile description that the police had released. Um, he had a history of violence and he was also in police custody. So they set his bail to a million dollars to keep him from leaving because usually for an assault you don't really get the bail up that high. So no one 50 or a hundred thousand dollars that you'd have to present in cash to get him out so the police did best to deter his family from getting him out because they thought he was the killer but after DNA testing came back it proved that his DNA did not match the semen that was found at the crime scene which means that he was not the killer so police were kind of back to square one they didn't really know what leads to go off of anymore what they did was they looked for other crime in the area that was similar to the crime that was happening in Gainesville because this person had killed uh, you know five different people in three different occasions and so he was definitely a repeat offender so they thought maybe they could find something that was similar so they kind of checked out different police departments at different states and see if they could find anything similar and they did in Shreveport Louisiana in November of 1989 there had been an unsolved triple homicide William Grissom and his eight-year-old grandson Sean as well as a 24 year old brunette were found murdered in their home in Shreveport Louisiana so this 24 year old was a brunette she was young kind of fit the description of somebody like Krista and Christina and Sonia and Tracy so investigators kind of put two and two together also they noticed the way that Julie's body was found so Julie was sexually assaulted and her body had been posed in a sexually suggestive way her body was also um, mutilated and cleaned and then posed so shortly after this discovery the Gainesville Police Department got a call from another police department in Florida saying that they had a guy that had been from Shreveport Louisiana that had been arrested for armed robbery and they discovered that that guy was also wanted in Shreveport Louisiana for attempted murder and this guy's name was Danny Rowling so in Louisiana he had actually attempted to kill his father and I actually looked into it because I was like what psychopath kills their father Danny's father was actually I mean this is no excuse for what he did Danny's father was actually extremely abusive towards him he beat Danny growing up about twice a week as a uh, child and also uh, Danny had once gotten a puppy and uh, Danny's dad decided to beat the puppy to death and 
Danny actually watched the puppy die in his hand. Also, Danny's history was just not the prettiest. Growing up, he had, you know, the classic signs of a serial killer, trouble he killed animals. Growing up, he stalked girls, assaulted people. He was just not the best kid. This mixed in with everything kind of created a serial killer. Police discovered that the same morning that Crystal Hoyt's body was found, there had been an unsolved armed robbery in Gainesville. So when police confronted the two people that they thought had robbed the bank, it was a black man and a white man. So the white man had ran into the woods, but the black man went ahead and gave up himself to the police and gave a fake name for the white guy that had ran into the woods. Later on, the police went ahead and, you know, combing through the wooded area and they found a makeshift campsite and they found a bunch of evidence. They found a ski mask with hair fibers, they found a pant with a blood stain on it and they went in and tested all of this. So they tested the DNA found at the campsite with the DNA found at the crime scenes and they noticed a lot of similarities. So fibers found on the ski mask matched fibers found in one of the crime scenes. Also the little blood stain that was on a pant found at the crime scene was Manny's blood. Clearly whoever made up this makeshift campsite was all connected. Danny Rowling was taken in questioning. They collected his DNA. He was ready in police custody from the armed robbery. They collected his DNA. They kind of were putting two and two together. So as the police were collecting DNA samples and everything, uh, the police told Danny that they would need some samples of his pubic hair. He was in the room at the time with like five or six other people and he said, oh you want samples of my pubic hair? He stood up, pulled down his pants, and ripped two handfuls of pubic hair and placed them on the table and was like, that should be enough pubic hair. They were able to match all the DNA with uh, the crime scene DNA. Everything was a match. They found the killer. But kind of unfortunately, during this time, DNA testing was fairly new. So it's not that it was inadmissible in court, but basically people were a little bit skeptical about it. So they needed a little bit more evidence. And since all they had was that forensic evidence, they kind of needed some something else and police didn't really have anything. But Danny made that super easy because he kind of just confessed to doing all the crimes. He told police everything and everything matched up with how the crime scene was found. And so they knew that they found their killer. Danny says that, so Danny says that he was actually at Walmart the same day with Christina and Sonia and he saw them. He thought that they were pretty. So he decided to follow them home, stalk them in their apartment, then break in and kill them and then decided to kill everybody else. He said that he traveled from uh, crime scene to crime scene on his bike to create less commotion. And these kind of seemed random, but also a little bit planned. You know, Danny was just a loony tune. Uh, so, so police had kind of found everything and they had all their information that they needed. So now it was time to evict Danny for these killings. Danny was in custody and everybody was like 99% positive that Danny Rowling was the killer, but they wanted to know why. Why did he commit these murders? Why did he brutally murder um, eight innocent people that he didn't even know? A very bizarre thing to do, the way he posed the body. It was disturbing. So people wanted to know why. Danny responded that he basically killed, he wanted to kill somebody for the eight years he had spent in prison for armed robbery, which to me doesn't make any sense because, um, you know, you're the one that, you know, armed robbed a place. So why are you bringing out your anger on innocent people that have nothing to do with you spending eight years of your life in jail for your own actions. People say that that was his motive. So the five killings in Gainesville plus the three um, Grissom family murders in Louisiana uh, totaled eight people. So that is what he told police. So the trial started in April of 1994 and his defense was going to plead the insanity case because this guy was literally insane. But on the first day of the trial, Danny actually pled guilty, literally in the court of law. It's like the first no-no. He stood up and he pled guilty to only five of the murders. He pled guilty to the five Gainesville murders and not the three Grissom family murders in Louisiana. I'm not really sure why he did that. He was found guilty for the murders and sentenced to death. But this whole time, uh, Danny was actually denying that he killed the Grissom family. He just never really wanted to own up to those murders, even though he had said that the eight murders were for each year that he spent in prison for armed robbery. He still really wanted to only claim that he killed uh, the five people in Gainesville. That was kind of odd to me. So he was sentenced 
to death uh, by lethal injection and he wasn't actually sent to death until about 12 years later on October 25th of 2006 is when people gathered around, a lot of the uh, family members from the victims gathered around to watch um, Danny be put to death. He had a last meal which consisted of lobster and shrimp which is kind of annoying how you know these people have last meal, their victims didn't get last meals. Danny um, died by lethal injection on October 25th of 2006. And that is the end of this story. I am so glad that they were able to catch this guy, this madman, this absolute disgusting human being. And I'm so glad that he is now dead and that there is a resolution to the story. I know nothing can bring back um, Christina and Sonia and Tracy and Julie and William and Manny and everyone that was involved in the story, Krista. But I just think it's just so remarkably sad. Girls and the men had their entire life ahead of them. I mean, I just think of like Sonia and Christina, they were freshmen. I don't even think they intended their first class yet. They had their lives, had their lives taken them from them in the most vile, disgusting way possible. And I am just so happy that they were able to catch this guy and that he is dead. And I just hope that, you know, people just stop killing people because that's not really cool. So that is it for this case. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about the Gainesville serial killer and I will see you guys in my next one. Bye.